evening, everyone. It's um, really a great honour and a pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for um, our annual Engelsberg Applied History Lecture. It's a relief to be doing so finally in person. This has actually been rescheduled, of course, because of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, that, that was a period where so many things were forced online. So it's certainly for me a great joy to see you all here in, in the room together and not on screens. Um, so long may that last. Um, it seems that absence has made us all the more eager for these things, and it's really nice to see the room so full. I'm really looking forward to a lively and fruitful discussion, and I'm sure you uh, have plenty of questions for our distinguished speakers this evening. So for those of you I haven't met before, my name is Maeve Ryan. I'm a senior lecturer here in, uh, in King's in the Department of War Studies, and I'm also the co-director of the Centre for Grand Strategy. Um, in a moment, I will introduce our distinguished guests um, and our speaker this evening, but very first, um, I'd like to give a, a quick word about the Applied History Programme um, and the background to this annual lecture. So one of the things we set out to do when we founded the Centre for Grand Strategy in 2016 was to redress what seemed like a dearth of strategic thinking at the heart of British policymaking. Um, and more broadly in how foreign policy was being um, understood, um, imagined, formulated and, and pursued. <coughs> Excuse me. And to bring a greater degree of his, particularly historical and strategic um, expertise into the um, modern practices of statecraft, diplomacy and foreign policy. So, in essence, the Centre for Grand Strategy started life as a group of 19th century historians with notions that we could change the world and make a difference. Um, and since then, as we've been pursuing that core mission, we have been very fortunate to meet and to join forces with um, partners at the Axon Johnson uh, Foundation for Public Benefit, a foundation based in Sweden. Um, and the Axon Johnson Foundation have been um, deeply occupied with and, and concerned with this question of how history um, historical understandings, mindsets, uh, approaches can illuminate present day problems, um, challenges, choices um, and can, uh, can raise new ideas and opportunities for, um, for the world of policy making and statecraft. They're interested in the, in the question of what applied history can mean, what the strengths and weaknesses of that approach might be, um, what it looks like when it's done very well, um, what it looks like when it's done very badly um, and the opportunities and risks that come with this sort of practice, the idea of applied history in, in, in action. So from these early conversations was born the Engelsberg Applied History Program and with generous support from the foundation for which we're very grateful, the program brought together the Centre for Grand Strategy here at King's with partners at the University um, of Cambridge and the Centre for Geopolitics. So I'm very, uh, very pleased, delighted in fact to welcome uh, two of our distinguished guests this evening, Dr. Matthias Hezerus from the, uh, representing the foundation and Professor Brendan Sims who is, uh, yes, Professor Brendan Sims from um, the University of Cambridge, who've been our partners on this for several years now. So since the academic year 2018 to 2019, <coughs> this Engelsberg Applied History Program has involved a shared program of seminars, public lectures, conferences, the creation of, I think, a, a new research agenda, a distinctly um, uh, you know, European um, uh, aside to the applied history question and debate, the compilation of an edited volume um, of classics in applied history, um, and building a really strong connections and really interesting engagements with the policy world, particularly in the UK. A number of um, engagement activities have spun out from this, including a project embedding um, uh, PhD students within the Cabinet Office National Security Secretariat, um, and another involving compiling uh, volumes of concise historical case studies to sort of feed into uh, and inform the, the policy process, but really driven by and shaped by conversations with and questions of interest to strategists um, and foreign policy officials here in the UK. The programme has also featured an Applied History Undergraduate Fellows programme, and I'm really pleased to see some of our fellows here this evening. This is, um, it, this is our attempt to train the next generation of, um, of applied historians, an extremely competitive programme um, and really wonderful um, talent that went into our second year um, of this programme and really enjoying that. And in fact, earlier today, um, Professor Gagan had the opportunity to meet with these students um, uh, and I think had a really, really interesting two-way conversation um, about perspectives on applied history. And of course, um, another major pillar of the uh, programme is the Engelsberg Applied History Annual Lecture. So delivering this year's lecture, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Patrick Gagan from Trinity College Dublin. He'll be speaking to us today on the career and life of Dr. Martin Mansour. So Professor Gagan is Professor in Modern History at Trinity College Dublin, an expert on the British-Irish relationship in the late uh, 18th and 19th centuries. He uh, probably needs little introduction, uh, but a very eminent historian whose books on the 1801 Irish Act of Union, the lives of Robert Emmett and Daniel O'Connell have been landmarks in Irish political history. Um, overall, his work addresses those complex competing themes of constitutional nationalism and republicanism, explores the tensions that led to the creation um, of a new political relationship between Ireland and Britain in 1800, 
um, the attempts to overturn the settlement by force um, thereafter, and as, as well the campaigns to transform the relationship through constitutional means. Professor Gagan has served as president of the Irish Legal History Society um, from 2018 to 2021, I think, and is chair of the advisory board of the Royal Irish Academy's Dictionary of Irish Biography Project. <coughs> Um, he also presents the award-winning, uh, very popular, long-running weekly radio show, Talking History on News Talk Radio, which is, I think, one of the most downloaded podcasts in Ireland. And if it's not already on your subscription list, you should add it. Because it covers all aspects of history, from ancient times to the present day. And for me, it's a bit of a masterclass in how you very quickly have to master a topic so you can talk about it. And uh, as an undergraduate, I could never understand how people could do that. And, and um, uh, Professor Gagan has been an inspiration in that regard. Um, he's also served, and I think very pertinently for the topic of today's um, discussion, as a special advisor to the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, from June 2017 to June 2020. <clears throat> and I suspect this has created some interesting perspectives on what it means as a historian to, to apply history in the wor real world, to apply some of those understandings and insights, and at least a perspective on the insight of the political machine. Um, and, in, and what the political machines of government maybe look like now in the past and some, uh, some probably interesting reflections that will inform your work since returning to academic life, I suspect, although I'm not sure how candidly you can speak about some of those things today. Um, looking forward shortly to welcoming uh, Professor Paul View. He will be joining us shortly. He's uh, very uh, sorry to be delayed and sends his apologies, but he will be with us momentarily and will be offering a response to this evening's lecture and I think contributing also his own insights from um, being closely involved with and observing events as they unfolded. Lord Bew is a professor of politics at Queen's University Belfast. He's formerly a historical advisor to the Bloody Sunday Tribunals, a crossbench peer <coughs> um, who served on the London Local Authority Bill Select Committee in 2007, for example, acted as secretary to the All Party Group on Archives and History, and is a member of the British Parliamentary Assembly, the uh, British Irish Parliamentary Assembly. Um, he also served on the select committees of both houses on the defamation bill and has spoken a lot on issues around academic freedom. He's an honorary fellow of Pembroke College in Cambridge and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, also the author of many works, uh, too many to name, but uh, including um, uh, Enigma, A New Life of Charles Stuart Parnell, um, uh, which is named as the Sun by the Sunday Times as Biography of the Year. And finally, as you all know, the topic of today's lecture, of course, is the life and career of Dr. Martin Manster. And we're very pleased to welcome as our guest of honour this evening, the man himself. So, um, <clears throat> welcome, Dr. Manser. Um, sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, I'm reluctant to give too much of an introduction here because I don't want to steal Patrick's thunder. <laughs> so, I'm going to confine myself to say that Dr. Manser is a historian by training whose subsequent career as a diplomat and advisor played a crucial role in um, helping to bring about the Northern Ireland peace process directly involved, of course, in the negotiations that led to the Good Friday Agreement. And for anyone who hasn't read this book, The Legacy of History for Making Peace in Ireland, it is a must read for anyone who's interested in the questions of um, applied history and, of course, the history of modern Ireland. And as we'll hear today, his, his unique approach to the application of history, the historical method, and some of those histor historians' way of thinking about problems uh, has proved invaluable across three decades of public service. Um, and I would say he's made a profound difference to the story of Ireland, um, being involved in laying the foundations for a whole new generation who were born since the Good Friday Agreement, who don't remember uh, the Troubles, and who see the island through um, completely different eyes, um, and who see, the, you know, who see and imagine a future that is entirely different to what seemed possible, certainly when I was growing up, and I suspect others in this room too. So delighted to say that we will have some closing reflections from Dr. Uh, Mansour later this evening. We'll also have some time for questions later on, um, so please do think of some nice difficult ones and save them up. Um, I'm sure our guests would like to get their teeth into those. Um, and I'll hand over to Professor Gagan now, just a quick housekeeping thing. Please make sure your phones are on silent. Um, please note that the lecture is being recorded and, and the questions uh, later too. And finally, there will be a drinks reception after, um, so please do stay for that. So with that, I will hand over to Professor Gagan. Thank you. Before I begin, just to say that it was a great honour to have been asked to deliver this year's uh, annual lecture uh, on, on applied history. And my thanks to Dr. Maeve Ryan and the team, Abby Bradley, uh, Andrew, Ollie. And my thanks also to the Axon Johnson Foundation for doing so much to, uh, to support and promote the work and the study of applied history. Uh, two notes before I begin. Uh, as Dr. Ryan said, uh, I was for three years an advisor to an Irish head of government, or Taoiseach. It was a, 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 an advisor to the head of government of the opposing political party to the one uh, that Dr. Mansour worked for uh, over three decades. Uh, so in some ways we approach the history of the past and some of the politics of this period in different ways. Uh, the other uh, note to say at the start is that I regret the title because uh, 
It should really, of course, be three Taoiseach and a peace process, but that didn't work as well, I thought, uh, so I made it Prime Minister's. And it was an attempt to uh, show the length of his, of his public service uh, across three decades, uh, whereas, of course, then serving for three Prime Ministers uh, would give that appearance of longevity, whereas, uh, of, of course, perhaps more recent events uh, uh, makes it. But if I was to have given it a different title, it would have been this one, uh, from an article in an Irish newspaper in 2000, and it's The Historian Who Makes History, and I think that's a very suitable title as well. On the fifth anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement in 2003, the subject of this evening's lecture, Dr. Martin Manser, published a volume of essays entitled The Legacy of History. The title was taken from the very first sentence of the Downing Street Declaration 10 years earlier, which had been agreed by the Taoiseach Albert Reynolds and the British Prime Minister John Major and published on the 15th of December 1993. This document was a major breakthrough in the peace process and became the catalyst for the IRA ceasefire eight months later and the loyalist one which followed after. It also helped make possible the landmark historical, historic agreement signed in Belfast on Good Friday in 1998. The declaration opens with the striking sentence that the most urgent and important issue facing the people of Ireland, North and South, and the British and Irish governments together was finding a way to remove the causes of conflict, to overcome the legacy of history, and to heal the divisions which have resulted. Writing in the foreword of Mansur's book, the Taoiseach Bertie Ahern began by acknowledging that in Ireland, history is rarely far away. The foundation of the state was the culmination of a long historical struggle. The historical resonances of the conflict in Northern Ireland, which had deep roots in the past, were equally pronounced. But there can also be moments of historic liberation. The Belfast or Good Friday Agreement of 1998 was one such moment. A key figure in that story, whose application of history helped liberate communities bound by their histories for too long, and who was able to use history to repair what had been fractured for centuries, was Dr. Martin Manser. Through virtually the entire length of the peace process, Manser served as a political advisor in Northern Ireland for three Taoiseach, or heads of government, Charles Hoy, Albert Reynolds, and Bertie Ahern, in 1982, and between the years 1987 and 1994, and 1997 to 2002. Ahern, who did so much, to make the Good Friday Agreement a reality, credited Mansura with bringing to the peace process a strong sense of historical responsibility and a deep familiarity with the long-standing issues that have required resolution. The historian who makes history was how Mansura was described in the headline of this Irish newspaper in 2000 when he announced his intention to run for election to Parliament. It described him as an extraordinary man and an unsung hero, and credited him with researching and defining the terms that were to become the basis of the Good Friday Agreement. Two years later, in 2002, there was a general election, and Manser became a politician in his own right, serving in the Oireachtas or Irish Parliament, first as a senator for five years, and then in the Dáil, where he was elected TD for Tipperary South in 2007. He became a Minister for State from 2008, where he had a range of responsibilities, the Office for Public Works, Finance and the Arts, until he lost his seat in the general election of 2011. Manser was also appointed by President Mary McAleese to the Council of State in 2004, a select group of councillors to the President, and in that capacity attended many of the events during the visit of Queen Elizabeth II in 2011 including the visit to the Garden of Remembrance and the historic dinner at Dublin Castle, both significant moments in the story of peace and reconciliation between Ireland and Britain. Since 2011, he has continued to be an influential and respected figure and was appointed by Taoiseach Enda Kenny from Fine Gael, the rival party to Fianna Fáil, as deputy chair of the government's expert advisory group on centenary commemorations. In that role, he has helped guide the commemorations of the events leading to the foundation of the Irish state 100 years ago with considerable skill and ability. Although the cover of Manser's book reads, The Legacy of History, 
the full title appears on the inside page and provides a revealing insight into his philosophy and approach. The legacy of history for making peace in Ireland. In giving his book this title, he was recognising how history had weighed heavily on the people of Northern Ireland, indeed on the people of the whole island. But he was also indicating his faith in how an historical legacy could become a positive force. Instead of ignoring the past or attempting to rewrite it to suit a present day agenda, Mansur was suggesting it should be encouraged and embraced. The genius of Mansur was the way he was able to take the contested legacies of the past and find a new way forward, imbued with his own spirit of idealism and hope. There are no statues to special advisors. <laughs> the most important work happens behind the scenes, and while fingerprints and influences can sometimes be detected, they often fade away in the glare of the spotlight. <clears throat> Historic documents, such as the Downing Street Declaration, have many hands. An attribution of specific lines is a risky and uncertain business. But the nuanced language about history in the Declaration, from the opening sentence to the final point, very much reflect the thinking and outlook of Mansur, and it was his historical perspective which shaped and informed the text. For someone like Martin Mansur, the motivation has always been public service, not public credit. This year's Engelsberg Applied History Annual Lecture is on the career of Dr. Martin Mansur, not because he deserves public recognition for his remarkable contribution to public life and to peace on the island of Ireland. It is because his career offers a perfect example of how historical thinking can be applied to the problems of the present. It also shows how intractable issues with long-standing roots can be resolved by embracing the legacy of history and not running away from it. It is a story about how thinking through time allows time to finally move forward after being frozen for far too long. It is a story with lessons for all of us today. There have been many descriptions of Mansur presented over his career, and they provide different insights into his image and contrasting perceptions of his influence. To Charles Hawhey, he was the original untidy academic, but someone he could trust with the most sensitive of responsibilities. To Albert Reynolds, he was someone whose philosophy was rooted in history. As Reynolds wrote in his autobiography, Mansur constantly looked back to go forward, drawing strength and wisdom from the likes of Parnell and de Valera and Lamasse, a Protestant Republican and a dedicated soldier of destiny within Fianna Fáil. To Bertie Ahern, he was quite simply a brilliant guy and absolutely 100% a straight talker whom everyone trusted. Outside of Fianna Fáil, however, many struggled to understand where Mansur, this Oxford-educated son of a Cambridge Don, was coming from. The Ulster Unionist MP, Ken McGuinness, for example, once described him as someone who articulated the die-hard Republican agenda in a posh English accent. <laughs> Gareth Fitzgerald, Taoiseach in the 1980s and a determined opponent of Hawi, described Mansur in his, in his autobiography as a man whose views seemed at times to be even more rhetoric, rhetorically Republican than those of his boss. This was a prevalent view in Fine Gael at the time, and yet in 1994, when John Bruton of Fine Gael became Taoiseach, he asked Mansur to stay on as a special advisor on Northern Ireland, though Mansur declined. Figures on the British side appreciated his value as well. On hearing the news of his departure in 1994, the British Prime Minister John Major wrote to Mansur, praising his profound historical knowledge as an invaluable asset in the ongoing search for a peaceful settlement in Northern Ireland. Senior figures in Britain were always aware of Mansur's influence and significance. Shortly before Tony Blair became Prime Minister, he spotted him at an event and wanted to know, is that guy Mansur? For Bertie Ahern, it was confirmation that they knew of him, of his position, and of his influence. Mansur was frequently portrayed as some kind of Richelieu figure in government buildings in Dublin. In a profile in the Belfast Telegraph in the 1980s, he was described as Hohi's man of mystery, something of a shadowy figure around the corridors of power. 
the Belfast newsletter paid Mansour the following tribute a decade later. There are some capable people at the Northern Ireland office, but if their brains are Land Rovers, solid and reliable, then Mansour's is a Porsche. In Dean Godson's major biography of David Trimble, the leader of the Un Ulster Unionist Party between 1995 and 2005, he is described as the Anglo-Irish eminence grise to successive Fianna Fáil Taoiseach and as being so formidable an adversary. Noel Dorr, the former Irish ambassador to Britain, who was Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs between 1987 and 1995, and once described as the most universally admired Irish diplomat of his generation, acknowledged that initially, some of those Mansur had dealt with over the years in Dublin, Belfast and London, found the intensity of his commitment disturbing. However, Dorr recognized that it was that very commitment which over time won him the trust of the Republican leadership in Northern Ireland. To his Sinn Féin IRA contacts during the peace process, there was only one name used to describe him. He was referred to quite simply as the man. An occasional criticism of applied history is that the professional historian can be too preoccupied with the rarefied ideas of the past and can over-intellectualize political problems, forcing links with historical events even when they do not exist, and falling to different biases in defending the connections. Mansura, perhaps even more than other intellectuals, inhabits a rich intellectual world, and he quite naturally sees allusions and connections between events across centuries and different countries. But they are never forced, they are never inauthentic, and they are never aimed at closing down a question, but rather at opening it up. One government press secretary who works closely with him described him in his memoir as a savant. And there is something extraordinary about the range and breadth of his historical knowledge and his incredible powers of recall. To give an example of how his mind works, on the 27th of January, 1983, there was a serious challenge to the leader of the opposition, Charles Hawhey, the third in 11 months, and there were rumours that he was preparing to resign. Mansur's mind on the day was, by his own admission, full of historical parallels, and he wondered whether it would be remembered as another day of dupes, a reference to the 10th of November, 1630, when Cardinal Richelieu's enemies mistakenly thought they had removed him. That morning, Hohi came to Mansur and asked him his advice on what he should do. According to a note Mansur made at the time, he said he thought there was still a faint chance of winning over the wavering middle ground, and he cited de Gaulle's position in 1968 and Frederick the Great's in 1761. Hohi seemed reassured by these historical parallels <laughs> and replied that if he thought that, then he would fight. And fight he did, defeating the confidence vote on the 7th of February by just seven votes. Hohi went on to be re-elected Taoiseach in 1987 when he made the historic decision to begin contacts with Sinn Féin. One of the most important qualities in any political advisor is good judgment, or, or indeed mixed with, what can be best described as common sense. Some have mistakenly underestimated Mansur because of their own preconceived ideas about the intellectual in politics. This is a criticism that can sometimes be leveled more broadly at applied history itself. The belief, sometimes justified, that intellectuals can be too rigid, too inflexible, and too unwilling to modify their approach to take into account the political realities of the day. This is not Mansur. As one unnamed colleague told the Irish Times for a profile in the 1990s, he is highly political and not an academic fuddy-duddy. From my own three years as a special advisor to a Taoiseach, in this case a Fine Gael leader, it is my belief that not every historian can be an applied historian. Too many are either not willing enough or not agile enough to adapt and adjust to secure a political result and move things forward. Sean Dignan, the government press secretary I referenced earlier, recognised that although Mansour was cast primarily as a theorist, he was also one of the most practical persons he had ever met. Whatever the problem or calamity, he never wasted time bemoaning fate or seeking to apportion blame. Instead, he would immediately set about identifying countermeasures 
to try and nullify the setback, or if possible, actually turn it to advantage. Mansur's career offers many practical examples, and perhaps the best one is the formation of the Fianna Fáil Labour Coalition in 1992. In the general election that year, following the acrimonious collapse of the outgoing coalition, Fianna Fáil had, in the words of Mansur, a nightmare, losing nine seats and looking unlikely to stay in power. However, attempts to create a rainbow coalition between Fine Gael, the Labour Party and Democratic Left floundered for personality as much as for policy reasons. A tentative approach was made by the Labour Party to Fianna Fáil as much to put pressure on Fine Gael as in any expectation of an agreement. What they didn't know, as, Martin Ma as Albert Reynolds later wrote in his autobiography, was that Martin Manser was prepared. All good historians are experts at documentary analysis. It is a fundamental skill and integral to any attempt to analyze and interpret the past. It is here that we see how Manser was able to apply his considerable skill with texts and documents to produce a deal for labor that was impossible to refuse, making it very difficult for them to avoid a coalition, even though it had won an historic result on the basis of removing Fianna Fáil from power. Within a few hours of contact being made, Labour received a response, drafted by Mansur, about how a coalition with Fianna Fáil could work. An advisor to the Labour leader later admitted that we were sucked in. The draft prepared by Mansur, in a way, trapped us. In Bertie Ahern's first government, Mansur was the sole advisor on EU matters and attended all summits and bilaterals. In this, his knowledge of French, German, and sometimes more importantly, Austrian history was constantly drawn upon. One example of this was when a way was being sought around the diplomatic blockade of Austria during the first Austrian People's Party Freedom Party coalition. This approach to thinking in time was embedded in government buildings. In 2002, Bertie Ahern had five special advisors. Four of them had carried out graduate level historical research and one of the group has told me that it led to fascinating office dialogue with Martin at the center of it. This advisor believed that the specific benefit of their background in history was twofold, perspective and method. He told me it reinforced an openness to seeing issues outside of the current news cycle and it very strongly biased us towards having a respect for researching topics properly. The career of Dr. Manser is a good way of exploring the operation of applied history for a final reason. A trained historian in his own right, he is also, of course, the son of Professor Nicholas Manser, who between 1953 and 1969 was the first Smuts Professor of the History of the British Commonwealth at the University of Cambridge, before being elected Master of St. John's College, Cambridge. His works included studies of the political relationships and challenges on the island of Ireland, including the problem of partition, as well as studies of in Irish and Indian nationalism. One distinguished Irish historian has described Nicholas as the supreme authority on the Government of Ireland Act 1920. Another has called him one of the finest historians of Ireland. Martin has always acknowledged the influence of his father on his thinking, and he has the advantage of being able to apply two generations of historical thinking to the challenges of the day. Speaking at the launch of the Collected Irish Essays of Nicholas Manser in Dublin on Friday the 11th of April 1997, Martin admitted that his various employers had perhaps a hopeful assumption that some small part of his father's expertise had rubbed off on him. This was a difficult day in the peace process, with the front page of the Irish Independent running the headline, Callous IRA Attack Ends Hope of a Ceasefire, following the non-fatal shooting of a 46-year-old policewoman and mother of three in Derry the night before. Manser ended his speech on a note of hope, calling for new skills and techniques, new forms of creativity, in pulling back from confrontation and brinksmanship and bridging narrow but deep and intractable differences. And he suggested that the opportunity for statesmanship from within and between the strength of the main traditions remains wide open. From an Anglo-Irish Protestant family, Nicholas Manser grew up in County Tipperary, 
where, as an eight-year-old boy, he heard the first shots at Salahed Byug in January 1919, which killed two policemen and which marked the beginning of the Irish War of Independence. As he wrote in his magisterial work, published posthumously, The Unresolved Question, The Anglo-Irish Settlement and Its Undoing, the events of Irish history were experienced as near realities, not as distant phenomena or as issues in high politics. In Mansur's entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, it is noted that although Mansur was able to maintain an Olympian detachment writing about Commonwealth history, in Irish history, this was much harder. The entry concluded that Mansur will be remembered as a scholar who tried to bring reconciliation to Ireland. Hailed as an unrivaled and humane analysis of contemporary problems in his beloved Ireland, the unresolved question left a challenge and a series of signposts for his son. Martin Manser inherited a broad imperialist outlook from his father, and as his biographer Kevin Rafter has recognized, his father's writing on Ireland had a profound influence. Like Nicholas, Martin became an historical realist who recognized that political independence in Ireland would simply not have happened without violence by such incidents as the Salahed Bjog ambush. As Rafter notes, Martin became a passionate and committed Republican, but a non-violent one. It was a position which often confused and bewildered those he dealt with, from those involved on the British side to nationalists and unionists on, of all extremes in Ireland. During the difficult days of the peace process, Mansur was occasionally portrayed as a pawn of the provisional IRA. This was a failure to understand Mansur's nuanced reading of Irish history and the complexity of his approach, one that believed in a nationalist ideology, which, whatever its faults, had a place for all the people on the island, rather than one built behind a smokescreen of pluralism as the ideology of a permanent 26-county state. This was not an endorsement of political violence to resolve the problems on the island. As Mansur explained in a public lecture on the value of historical commemoration and its role in peace and reconciliation in February 1998, to be a player in democratic politics requires a definitive renunciation of physical force vetoes. Sean Dignan recognized that Mansur's insistence that he was unalterably constitutional made not a whiff whiff of difference to his detractors, although he conceded he was every bit as Republican as portrayed by admirers and critics alike. This lecture could easily have been subtitled Parnell and the Man, because the 19th century Irish nationalist leader Charles Stuart Parnell had a huge influence on Mansur's thinking. We are therefore fortunate to have in Lord Bew, a respondent who is one of the preeminent scholars on Parnell, as well as someone who played a significant role himself during the peace process, most crucially as an advisor to David Trimble. It is fascinating to study how two historians were able to apply historical thinking to the greatest of challenges and how they succeeded in making history. They were not always in agreement. They often interpreted the evidence in very different ways and reached different conclusions. But both were all the time working towards peace and reconciliation and deserve the title of peacemakers. It is revealing that Mansur began an essay taking an historical perspective on the peace process published in 1996 with the words, I have always found Parnell a particular inspiration, not so much because of the shared background, but because of the exceptional vigor of his leadership. Between 1878 and 1886, Parnell had demonstrated how it was possible to build an extraordinary coalition of support channeling the constitutional nationalist and republican traditions backed by the resources of Irish America and use it to make substantial progress. In 1986, Mansur delivered a paper at Avondale, Parnell's home, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the first Home Rule Bill, and he used it to express an idea that drove his thinking in the years ahead. It was the idea of a political compact between different strands of nationalism in place of violence, on the lines of the new departure, a democratic nationalist consensus rather than pan-nationalism. This was to drive his thinking on the peace process in the critical early stages, backed up by his reading of Irish history, 
which had led him to conclude that the root cause of the conflict was a series of historical wrongs inflicted on the island by the British Empire. Mansur believed that there were significant problems with the Government of Ireland Act of 1920 and the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921, which had to be resolved, and that fixing these would help make peace possible. Born in Surrey in England on the 31st of December 1946, Martin Mansur was descended, as he described it himself, from the class of those who were the principal beneficiaries of the political setup that existed from the mid 17th century to the early 20th century. In other words, the Protestant Unionist landlord class in Ireland. From an early age, Martin re wrestled with problems of destiny and divided identity. It was not entirely clear to him whether he was English, Irish or Anglo-Irish or where his allegiance lay. But as time went on, Irish history, Irish poetry and the considerable time he spent in Ireland shaped his sympathies and his outlook. From school at Canterbury, Mansour went to Christ Church at Oxford where he studied PPE. At the Oxford Union, he saw Ian Paisley, the unionist politician and firebrand, deliver a crude assault on Catholicism and he noted the way it played shamelessly to prejudices not too far below the surface of English life. He read the Irish Times almost every day at Oxford, keeping up with events in Ireland, and he found Irish politics more appealing than British politics because it was more pragmatic and less ideological. Less congenial was the tendency of some contemporaries at Christchurch to get embarrassingly drunk late at night and sing Lands of Hope and Glory and Rural Britannia. Even more irritating, a junior member of the Cecil family once stopped him to interrogate him about his loyalty. After his BA, Mansur completed a PhD in pre-revolutionary French 18th century history, which was submitted in 1973 as the Revolution of 1771. After deciding against a career in academia, Mansur joined the Irish Civil Service, believing it was the next port of call for people of an academic frame of mind. He came first in the assessment process and was given a role in the political division of the Department of Foreign Affairs. In 1975, he was sent to the Irish Embassy at Bonn as third secretary in his first and only diplomatic posting. This was a hugely influential period, both in terms of the way the Federal Republic was run in a broadly social democratic way, and also the relationship between East and West Germany. As Rafter notes, in later years, when discussing the peace process in Northern Ireland, Mansur would frequently make references to, this, to his experience in Germany, where unity followed the collapse of communism in 1989. In 1977, he returned to Dublin, where one colleague observed that he was always seeming to be churning out stuff. Ideas seemed to be always coming from him. A successful career in the department, culminating in an ambassadorship, seemed inevitable. But in December 1980, Mansur made the decision to leave foreign affairs and work for the head of government, Charles Hawhey, in the department of the Taoiseach. This astonished many of his contemporaries, even more so when he left the civil service in the summer of 1981, following a change of government after the general election. Giving up any work security, he became the head of research for Fianna Fáil in opposition, and Hawhey admired him for taking this risk as much as for his republican and nationalist outlook. For his part, Mansur admired the pragmatism of Fianna Fáil, a party which had been founded in the 1920s following the split over the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1981, 1921, which it opposed. Mansur's belief in social democracy and his desire to do something substantial on Northern Ireland drove his own new departure. He later said that he did so, motivated as much by the desire to see Ireland avoid having to take the Thatcherite road as by any desire to promote a more assertive and thought out democratic republicanism. Over the next two decades, he played a significant role behind the scenes for three leaders of Fianna Fáil. A journalist later suggested in print that because Fianna Fáil has never been overburdened with academics and intellectuals, his knowledge and scholarly skills made him almost indispensable to the party. And this was certainly the popular perception. Some in Fianna Fáil struggle to come to terms with their new recruit, especially with his accent and intellectual demeanour. Frank Dunlop, a Fianna Fáil strategist, said that when he first met him and heard the accent, he nearly collapsed, thinking, this is going to go down a fucking treat with the lads. 
Seamus Brennan, a Fianna Fáil politician, admitted that Mansour has started off on the back foot with them, but that as soon as they met him, they realised they were dealing with someone very different, a person with an intellectual understanding of the Northern Ireland issue. Jokes that he was a cross between Dr. Strangelove and Dr. Mengele never caught on, and very quickly they would brook no criticism of him from outsiders. Fianna Fáil briefly returned to power in 1982 before the government collapsed, and Mansour spent the next five years in opposition before Charles Hawhey returned to power in 1987 as the head of a minority government. Throughout this time, he was, as Rafter has noted, the principal speechwriter for all important Fianna Fáil speeches, as well as the unofficial party historian. The origins of the peace process is hotly debated, but for Mansour it began in 1986 when Father Alex Reed, a redemptorist priest, contacted Hawhey. Two years later, Hawhey asked Mansour to be part of a secret Fianna Fáil delegation to meet with Sinn Féin, to complement the talks which were ongoing between the SDLP and Sinn Féin. On the 2nd of May, 1988, Mansour travelled to the Redemptorist Monastery in Dundalk alongside Dermot O'Hearn, a newly elected Fianna Fáil TD, and Richie Healy, a party official. By this time, Fianna Fáil were back in government, and it would have been fatal for the government if the meeting became public. Dermot O'Hearn, for example, believed that the minority government wouldn't have lasted five seconds. The solution was, in Mansour's own words, to send a low-level delegation, and this offered a number of benefits. First, it could be a deniable contact if things went wrong, to borrow the title of a recent study of the back-channel negotiations which took place at this time. Hawhey told Dermot O'Hearn quite bluntly that if things went wrong, he was on his own. Second, the strategy also allowed a defence that this was a meeting between party figures and not officially sanctioned government talks. Finally, Mansour believed that his own background made him a good choice, as he felt it would be hard to portray him to the public as, quote, shall we say, a crypto provo. It is important to remember just how risky these meetings were in the context of Irish politics at the time and long-held views about talking to terrorists. Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act prevented the media from interviewing figures in Sinn Féin or the IRA, and any engagement was seen as an endorsement. Gerry Adams, the president of Sinn Féin, who headed up the Republican delegation in 1988, and Martin McGuinness, who headed up the talks between 1992 and 1994, were described in the most popular weekend newspaper, the Sunday Independent in 1988, as two leading northern terrorists and political gangsters. A front page story a year earlier suggested that Adams was not a psychopath, but someone who would send out psychopaths to do their worst. And it was Jerry Adams who Mansour set out to meet in 1988. Mansour's instructions from Hawhey was to see what, Fianna Fáil, what Sinn Féin had to say, but as he later admitted, this was an instruction I completely ignored. I'm afraid I, could, I did a great deal more than just listen. At a crucial point in the dialogue, Ahern made the point that violence was unacceptable as a route forward, and Gerry Adams responded with the question, if you had British troops on the streets of Dundalk, Dermot Ahern's hometown, what would you do? It was here that Mansur decided to apply his historical understanding of Irish nationalism and discuss Parnell. <laughs> Mansur put forward the argument that nationalism was strongest when it was politically united, as in the new departure of 1878 between the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Land League and the Fenians, and that the use of violence weakened nationalism in the North, between North and South, and indeed in Irish America. The delegations met again a second time on the 24th of June. At both meetings there was no formal agenda, these were exploratory talks, and Mansour got the impression that Sinn Féin was trying to break out of the extreme political isolation they were in, especially after the, especially after the atrocity of the Enniskillen bombing the year before. Mansour's approach was different to John Hume's, the leader of the SDLP. Hume believed that since the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985, Britain was politically neutral with regard to the future of Northern Ireland. At one of the meetings, Mansour made it clear that he didn't agree with that, because you have to distinguish between the rules of the game and what you are actually trying to achieve in the game. Mansour did this deliberately, to show the Sinn Féin delegation that he was a realist, 
and that he believed it was important for him in this and subsequent dialogues not to engage in anything which in the medium, medium term will undermine your credibility. The Sinn Féin talks with the SDLP had broken down between the first and second meeting, and because of this and other political considerations, the direct meetings came to an end. There had been... meetings uh, continued then, sorry, resumed in uh, 1992. By this time, there was no change to the principle of not talking to terrorists, and Mansour knew that if it came out in the wrong way at the wrong time, he would be out on his ear within 24 hours. It should also be noted that at these meetings, they contained a considerable personal risk, especially as Mansour used the train to travel, and there were serious security concerns about him becoming a loyalist target in the 1990s. And indeed, this is something that Martin McGuinness uh, re reminded them of and advised them of at this time. The meetings resumed again in 1992, usually in Dundalk, sometimes in the Redemptorist House in Dublin, except this time Mansour met with Martin McGuinness, who had taken over as the chief Sinn Féin negotiator and who was always accompanied by a second person. It was widely understood that McGuinness wielded considerable influence over the IRA, and so these meetings were of a much different tone and significance. Mansour and McGuinness met regularly from October 1992 to June 1993 and worked on developing a text the Republicans, the SDLP and the Irish government could sign up to and which could form the basis of a joint Irish-British declaration that could secure an IRA ceasefire. A draft agreement was finalised in June 1993 and presented by Albert Reynolds to the British Cabinet Secretary. As, Mar as Mansour recognised, it was not ideal from the point of view of the, of the Irish government, but it formed the basis for future discussion and negotiation. Mansour kept working on a text that might satisfy all sides, stretching things, as he later admitted, to the outer limits of what was acceptable. None of this was public knowledge until in December 1993, shortly before the Downing Street Declaration was signed, a BBC Panorama programme outed him as the government's link with loyalist and republican paramilitaries. As one newspaper reported, there were gasps of astonishment in the British media as the shy and bookish academic who acts as a one-stop historical interpretive centre for Taoiseach Albert Reynolds was acknowledged as a consultant architect of the Irish government's plan for future peace. He could so easily have slotted into the British team. There were many people involved in drafting and reworking the text, which became the Downing Street Declaration of December 1993, but Mansour was a crucial figure in bringing it all together. The public criticisms, however, continued. In the summer of 1994, there was an Irish television primetime story about Mansour's continuing direct and frequent contacts with Sinn Féin. Following on from this, the Sunday Independence, as I mentioned, the best-selling Irish newspaper and probably the most influential at this time, attacked Mansour for pursuing a ceasefire, suggesting that it might be a short-term political gain for the Taoiseach, but a long-term setback for peace. It accused Mansour of talking to the wrong people, giving its own opinion that he should be mending fences with unionists instead of making a clandestine pact with terrorists. Not for the first time, the newspaper had got it badly wrong. In August 1994, an IRA ceasefire was announced, and this was followed by a loyalist ceasefire, and although they would break down, they paved the way for the agreement which was to follow. Albert Reynolds' government collapsed in controversy in November 1994, and a rainbow coalition was formed. Mansour chose to follow the new leader of Fianna Fáil into opposition, a decision that maintained his credibility and position of trust with his own party, as well as with those outside, although Jerry Adams was furious. In May 1997, there was a change of government in the UK with the landslide victory of Labour that saw Tony Blair become Prime Minister. A month later, Fianna Fáil returned to power following its own election victory. The change of governments created a new, mon a new momentum in the peace process. The story of the making of the Good Friday Agreement has been well told. There were many people who risked their reputations for peace and who deserve credit and recognition. 
as this lecture is on the application of history, I will confine myself to those specific examples. And there are a number of occasions where Mansur applied history to help advance the process. Upon returning to government buildings, Mansur resumed his work as the back channel to Sinn Féin and worked to restore the ceasefire, which was announced in July 1997 so that talks could resume. Most crucially, in the lead up to what became the Good Friday Agreement, Mansur worked with the Irish Attorney General to find new language for Articles 2 and 3 of the Irish Constitution, lines which asserted that the national territory was the whole island of Ireland and which were anathema to unionists but articles of faith for Republicans. Mansur presented his thinking to the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party in the early months of 1998 because he and Ahern knew that giving them up would be huge for everyone and that they all needed to be clear why this constitutional change was on the negotiating table. Ahern later praised Mansur for the mastery of the historical sweep and dimensions of the whole area and his acute sense of strategy, believing that this had made it politically possible to get agreement both within Fianna Fáil and within the country for those changes. These changes were later ratified in a referendum by 94.4% of the people in Ireland. As we know, an agreement was signed on Good Friday in April 1998, which achieved the historic breakthrough dreamt about for so long. It was by no means the end of the story. There were other issues still to resolve, but it did mark a new beginning, and it has rightly been seen as a landmark in the history of the island of Ireland and of relations between Ireland and Britain. An Irish Times profile of Mansur, published just three days after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in April 1998, began by admitting that he was once depicted as an out-of-date nationalist, before recognising that he was now widely acknowledged as one of the most important contributors to the historic rapprochement between nationalism and unionism. Around the same time, President Mary McAleese, the Irish Head of State, sent Mansur a handwritten note to recognise the role he had played behind the scenes. With greatest respect and admiration for the work of your patient, scholarly genius. Well done. On the 2nd of December 1999, the British-Irish Agreement came into effect and the Government of Ireland Act of 1920 was finally repealed. The Guardian newspaper ran an article on the diffident, unsung figure who slipped into the back of the Irish Cabinet Room for the formal signing ceremony, which saw Articles 2 and 3 amended. In the article, Mansour was acknowledged as someone whose laborious efforts helped transform the political climate on both sides of the border and laid the basis for the constitutional changes. The journalist noted that another Irish Protestant also had a ringside seat, the 19th century nationalist leader Charles Stuart Parnell, whose portrait looked down on the table. Given the role that Parnell had played in Mansur's own thinking and in his very first meeting with Gerry Adams, it is appropriate that he was represented at the ceremony where the unresolved question finally received an answer. Peter McDonough, who worked closely with Mansur in government buildings under Bertie Ahern, has told me that he was not just big on peace, he was even more committed to reconciliation. In the aftermath of the Good Friday Agreement, Mansur did a huge amount of outreach to unionist loyalist groups, and on one occasion in his office, introduced McDonough to David Irvine, who had helped bring about the Loyalist ceasefire in 1994, and Billy Hutchinson, an important Loyalist figure in decommissioning. They were in Dublin seeking, re seeking reassurance about the direction of affairs. As it happens, McDonough is a grandnephew of one of the leaders of the 1916 Rising, indeed one of the signatories of the famous proclamation, and Mansur always introduced him as such. It seems Mansur loved introducing him to the hardliners on both sides of the in the North through this perspective, making the team in Dublin look like an even more exotic Republican enclave. <laughs> Looking back on, the, on those meetings, McDonough has recognised that a detailed knowledge of the histories of movements which were marginal but violent was essential when advancing the peace process. Mansur was able to apply his historical expertise to the finer points of Republican and Loyalist theology, and he was able to do it with an empathy, a deep understanding, and a respect for the legacy of history. 
In doing so, he made a new future possible. Professor Nicholas Manser believed that the historian cannot stand above events, but can only stand aside from them. As the distinguished Irish diplomat Noel Dorr wrote 20 years ago, his son did neither. Instead, he played a part in shaping events which could ultimately bring lasting peace to the island. Growing up, I never believed that we would have peace in Northern Ireland. I was convinced we were condemned to endure a permanent cycle of killing, retaliation and hate. Working behind the scenes at great personal risk to his life, his reputation and his career, Martin Manser helped to rescue us from the nightmare of history. At a moment when profound change was possible, a moment when history itself could be applied to repair the damage of centuries, we were fortunate to have people who believed we could achieve the impossible. Cometh the moment, cometh the man. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Paul View to uh, for a response. Thank, thank you very much. First of all, thank you to Patrick for a brilliant lecture. First five minutes I missed because of a late vote uh, in Parliament down the road, and I'm delighted to be here. And I, what I heard was really stunning and very precise and very accurate in terms of the significance of my friend uh, Martin Manser's career. Um, it, it's my job as a discussant to expand on it, but the first thing I want to do is to uh, um, comment on one of the points you're making about Martin's conversation with Charles Hockey about a narrow vote and about the intellectual and politics. Um, and Martin gave a number of historical analogies to the beleaguered uh, Prime Minister of Ireland. Um, but the thing about this is, when you're a historian in intellectual and politics, the advantage you have is you can talk to people, and you can talk quite a long time. All the time you're counting the votes. As the, uh, but people assume that you're thinking about George III or some other thing, because you will talk. And we do talk. And we can talk about all these historical analogies. But actually, the advantage, anybody who wants to play this game has to be thinking all the time about the votes and the counting. And it's going on all the time while you talk about historical analogies, great moments, Parnell, what would Parnell have done now? You're actually thinking, do we have the votes to do this tomorrow or today? And, and, and I think this is the point. Uh, everybody knows that Edmund Burke is, in terms of the history of political thought, the greatest Irishman, the Bachi, the for many people, the greatest figure entirely in history of political thought. Martin worked for a long time alongside a rather prosaic, uh, less enlightened, perhaps, uh, figure of, of, of Irish politics called Ray Burke. And I want to say now, for, for if you want to be an intellectual in politics, sometimes you have to say, better Ray Burke than Edmund Burke. <laughs> Sorry about that. And some of you in this room might know that occasionally Ray Burke could take shortcuts. Uh, um, uh, you know, and uh, 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 rather brutal shortcuts at times. But, you know, actually, if you do this, it's quite a lot of the time, it's better Ray Burke than Edmund Burke. Uh, uh, so I just, that, that initial story struck home to me. I want to claim credit, I think, in public for the first time, and I was actually in part behind the fact that Martin was offered a job in the, at a crucial moment by the Bruton government. Uh, there was a coalition, which the great John Bruton, whom I knew, established, but I was then, one of the parties in that I was closely connected to and involved in, the Democratic left, which was in that coalition, led by Francis de Rossa, and Professor Henry Patterson, my dear friend, and I went to Francis de Rossa and said, actually at this point, it would be desirable in the peace process if Martin, Martin Manser stays and plays a role. And that was part of the reason why the offer was actually made. So I want to claim, uh, to, to claim that now, after all these years, it doesn't matter to anybody except perhaps to, 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 to Martin or to me. This does not mean that I share Martin's worldview, or there are problems with Martin's worldview. 
And the first thing I have to say is I am much more a child of the plain people of Ireland than, than Martin. My mother is an Irish Catholic. I'm not from any kind of ascendancy world, but respectable Irish Catholic who actually disliked intensely Sinn Féin, Republicanism and so on. So I'm also on the other side, one quarter English, one quarter Northern Irish Protestant. So um, I do say to my friends in Sinn Féin, as my father was in Belfast, my mother from Cork, I do say this is what a United Ireland looks like, me, and they don't seem as pleased about it as they ought to be. <laughs> for, some, for, for some reason, they just don't seem to be as pleased at all about what a real United Ireland actually is. But this is why I have a slightly different take on all this, and I accept everything that Patrick said, and you would expect it from Patrick, whose brilliant books, uh, 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 his brilliant uh, volumes on Daniel O'Connell I've, I've written about at some length. Everything he said is precise and, and true. There is a other problem, and it's a darker side to it. Uh, uh, and the darker side to it is legitimization in Irish culture of a violent campaign which took uh, the lives of thousands of Irish people uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, on a sectarian basis largely. Uh, uh, and the legitimization of it, and indeed the fact that it has now become more fashionable than ever. Uh, um, and that is the problem. And I speak as somebody who is the child of a, the sort of Irish Catholic family who is not comfortable of this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, uh, and we did this, and I was part of this on the other side. I remember Martin very, very kindly arranging a meeting with Bertie Ahern about six weeks before the Good Friday Agreement, maybe two months, going to Dublin, and it was held in the, um, not in government buildings, but in Bertie's constituency office. And at the end of it, Bertie was a lot of people, a lot of his constituents in anoraks and so on. And, and then there was me, I'd really brushed up for the day, nice suit and, <laughs> and so on, to see the teacher come down from Belfast. Uh, and um, it was, a, first of all, I, Martin came down, greeted me, said, the teacher could be finished in a few minutes, and, you could go in and talk to him. The idea was to provide the sort of language from Bertie that would make it easier for David Trimble to make the deal that he eventually made in 1998. And a part of the interview was published to key bits in the Irish edition of the Sunday Times, but later, but the, a longer version is in, in, the, in the magazine Parliamentary Brief, and the longer version is, is very interesting uh, um, for historians at any rate. And, um, so Martin, Lee, I was absolutely sure because I didn't know Bertie at all. Uh, I was I was just assuming that Martin would stay in the room, and he said he said to Bertie, "This is Paul View," and and and, uh, and he walked out together. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen here? Because Bertie is actually quite shy. Uh, Hail fellow, well met, after a couple of pints or whatever, and could work himself up to it. But it is there's a shy side to Bertie. So the teacher looks at me, try to remember who I am what relationship I have to the Anorak people who had just been going in and out with their, with their children and so on. Because all Martin said was, this is Paul Buse. The teacher was struggling now. Why is he here? He said, it doesn't take him long to remember. So I sit down and I said, what am I going to talk about? Now, I did know something about Bertie. Well, actually, I knew quite a lot. But in that part of Dublin, you're close to home farm, which is the uh, junior football team which produced Liam Brady and Frank Stapleton. And I knew a lot, and I'd been down, I'd watched football matches in Dublin, so I uh, soccer first, as is Bertie. Uh, and and I, I said, we looked out the window, and I said, home farm, we talked a bit about <coughs> Liam Brady, Frank Stapleton, uh, which those of us in the room support, are still will remember. Uh, and uh, we talked about this for a couple of minutes, and Bertie is gradually going, who is this fellow? Why is he here? Why is Martin just brought him in? And he's, the cogs are wheeling around. We then move on to something that Bertie and I have in common, which is Manchester United. And it's a result the previous night when my wife is from Manchester, from just beside the ground. And we <coughs> talked about this for a minute. He then said something to me, which just tells you something about Bertie as a politician. I then said, well, you know, home farm and so on, lots of very good soccer players come from this part of Dublin. And he said, yes, now he gave me a precise figure. I've now forgotten what it was, maybe 24 are currently with English clubs. I said, are they with English clubs? And I said, yeah. And I said, Tishuk, I said, why do you have a precise figure? Why don't you say dozens or are there a lot of them? 
And he said, well, actually, I have to know precisely who has gone to be with an English club because most of them will fail. Most of them will not make it as Frank Stapleton as Liam Brady. And they will come back and they will be disappointed and they will hang around on street corners and they will engage in burglaries and there'll be trouble. So I have to know, as the, as the TD for this constituency, exactly who is gone and who is likely to come back and, and be a young man on the street corners making trouble in this part of Dublin. I think it's actually quite really, really interesting if you think of why Fianna Fáil became a great party uh, in terms of its respect for detail and understanding of people's lives. And if we got off that and we finally did the interview, which Martin had said, and Bertie, by the way, was superb in the interview. He finally worked out what, you know, they always knew what it was about, kind of connected. And, and everything he said, you could, there wasn't a word wasted in terms of what you had to say to make it easier for David Trimble to do a few weeks later what she did, which is support support the Good Friday Agreement in terms of it was inspired by democracy, pragmatism, and so on. But to go back to my problem, and I will conclude my, my, the, the difficulty that I have with this, and as I say, in many respects, I have a lot in common with Martin. When I arrived in Cambridge, his father was still teaching. He supervised still as Master of John's, the great David Fitzpatrick's. PhD, a colleague of yours, mm -hmm. uh, and part of one of many books that's on Martin, uh, and Martin's father was for a long time a force in my life. Do you think there's something that has to be added to this story? That in terms of Irish nationalism, Martin's father worked for British intelligence. He worked for British information service during the war. For any Irish nationalist, that's British intelligence. One of his job was to encourage Irish support for the British war effort. Worked very well. My mother, an Irish Catholic, joined Joined, joined the British Army, which I'm enormously proud of as part of that. My, why I'm here is, in those days, Protestants from Belfast did not marry Catholics from Cork unless they happened to find themselves both, my father and the RAF doctors, in the other side of the world, in Delhi. That's where those sort of people got married, which is why I'm here. Martin's job was to encourage, Martin's father's job was to encourage British support, Irish support for the war effort. Now, it had to be done tactfully, and I've seen documents and letters from him, which are in the public record of Northern Ireland on this point. But the job was fundamentally to ensure, as much as it was reasonably possible, Irish people, and by the way, Irish people, in my view, had a legitimate interest in the outcome of that war. And I absolutely, I have a real problem, as always, with the whole doctrine of Irish independence. Not that, to say it was the only choice, given the history that Ireland could have taken, just that it was somehow the morally superior choice that I've, I've, I just always gag on. And I, 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 not, not that there was no other pragmatic choice, and what had had to happen is the people. My mother, I think, joined British Army quite close to the day when Charles Hockey was, uh, at Trinity College was pulling down the flag which went up for the and she decided to make sure who had actually won. Uh, um, slight quid, but, but very near the day, and Charles Hockey, uh, who Martin worked for, dragged down the, 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 the Union Jack, which Trinity College people put up, and, because if they were pleased. They thought it was a good idea. Controversial, I know, that Hitler had been defeated. Um, difficult one to take in, but uh, from a certain type of Irish point of view, and uh, um, my, father went, my mother went the other way and, uh, and, and, and signed on the dotted line. Uh, uh, and was then in the army for the next two, two or three years. My father had been there for some time in, 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 in India. Now, and in you know, the whole question of the war in Japan and in Australia for a while. So I, I'm coming from this from a very, very different angle. It's, I'm not talking, as, as Martin is, from the Protestant descendancy and a view of that history and possibly a degree of guilt which is reflected in things he's written. I'm afraid I'm talking from the plain people of Ireland. And here is the outcome. This is the dark side of the great achievements. What Martin did saved many lives. What Martin did established a stable, or it, uh, he was more important, I think, than any other official behind the scenes on either government, established a stable Ireland until Brexit, which destabil indisputably destabilised things. But the stable Ireland, in which the long-term future was there for a democratic re resolution, uh, um, uh, 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 between the two communities and the evil, and that is his great achievement. Um, Brexit has upturned everything. Uh, I voted against it. I don't share. My colleagues in the House of Lords are absolute horror of it. I just think it was not going to be good for Ireland, and it most certainly has not been good for Ireland. There's just no question about that. And it is unleashed again. 
And ag uh, the anglophobia of the main Irish media now it was not something we worked with. When w Martin and I were involved, the uh, Irish media's view was the English are wonderful. They prefer us to those terribly boring Ulster Protestants of the North. And this is, uh, we are the civilised people, they are too, and we must somehow get them to see that these Ulster Protestants are not what they brought to heel. This is now totally changed. Ireland now believes it has only one university in the top 200, but it believes it's far cleverer than the UK, which is three in the top 10. No problem. And every, you can't, you know, just amazing change and the, you know, the, the general tone of derision towards the neighbouring islands. It will be harder to sustain now. There's a different prime minister, I think. But nonetheless, the general tone of derision has created the context in which the Republican movement has returned. It is forgiven for everything. And the real test is this, Jerry Adams and paedophilia. Uh, there's no question of Jerry covering up his brother's paedophilia and doing exactly what many a Catholic bishop fell on, which is moving around priests around the country because they were guilty or because it was embarrassing, but not really clamping down. And in Ireland now, that is sin of sins. Now, there's just no historical argument. Jerry's brother, who's now gone to a better place, but Jerry's brother was involved in paedophilia on a fairly significant scale. And Jerry did exactly the same thing. He moved him around the country, just as a Catholic bishop did, uh, and, and out of the firing line, but there is no question, there is no answer. But you see, it's the one remaining. Political murder is not a crime, unforgivable in the world we live in. I fully accept that. But paedophilia is. But if you are in such a position, that your public position, even though this is a thing, the last remaining sin, you're not burnt for it. Martin will remember a Fianna Fáil government falling because of the most indirect connections with the then Taoiseach between toleration of paedophilia, a very complicated story of a legal case and so on, uh, and it not being pursued properly, etc. Um, but this tells you we're in a new space, that the rules don't, once you're in a new space where the rules, even the last remaining moral rules we have, and there aren't many left, don't apply. Uh, um, that what we have, that what has happened is, we did it, and we did it, and by the way, I, I'm as guilty. We legitimised it, and we said, let bygones be bygones, and we, we, we said, this must be sorted, we must make a break, we must have this peace process. Many people are alive today because of the work of Martin in doing it. But, and I'm not even saying what is happening now necessarily means that other people will die, although we're heading into a very tricky period in relations between North and South and, and between the two communities. But if you legitimise it, if you don't say there must be an accounting, why did you kill those thousands of people for a cause which could never have succeeded? Why did you believe, even at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, that these political arrangements were going to lead to a United Ireland by 2016? Why did you say all these things? Um, why did you do all these things? And there's no accounting, and there is nothing. And the Irish women's football team sings songs in favour of the IRA and so on when they, when they brilliantly qualify for a major competition. Uh, um, and, and when the Sinn Féin now is so far ahead in the polls in Dublin, it will certainly form the next government, possibly without uh, any, what you might call, uh, coalition with other parties. When you legitimise it, there is a price to be paid. So I am here to support Mike Martin and what he's done in the peace process and the great the really great brilliance of look, and there have been certain times during this period in the last few years when, to be honest, um, the Irish Foreign Minister is, I put this gently, doesn't have a tone of voice for the North. When I'd have given anything to have Mar uh, to have Bertie back, anything, and Bertie I've talked to a number, anything to have somebody who actually was halfway listening to an, uh, another tradition. And I would have given anything to have a Martin in the Taoiseach's office in the last couple of years. Anything at all, as the thing slid down and Anglo-Irish relations hit their nadir, given anything to have him there and to have Bertie back. Anything at all, or even Albert back. Anything at all to have them back, uh, uh, to, to, have, to have kind of relatively normal human beings, if I can put it like that, and people who are uh, flexible and not high on the new... The, the vanity of the new Dublin. Uh, I, I would have given anything, but and, and, and that's uh, uh, you know that's part of my esteem for Martin. But we have to face up to this now. 
there is a problem with what we did, and I'm as culpable as he is. We just said, let bygones be bygones. We can't bring those thousands of people back to life. And we never said really properly, uh, excuse me, Your Honour, Mr. Jerry, um, there are all these dead people everywhere. Their ghosts are all around us. They died, whatever about the justice or otherwise of Irish history, they died in a campaign which was set to achievement, which was irrational, which could never have actually delivered in its own terms. Never could have. And without Brexit, by the way, the stability arising from the Good Friday Agreement will be entirely solid now, as has already been said by, by, by others. But this is a problem. There is a problem about what we did, and I'm going to shut up about it, but just to say it, and it doesn't take away anything at all from what has been said about Martin. And there's a problem about what I did as well. But my gratitude to Martin is massive, and I do wish we could have had him back in the Taoiseach's office in the last two to three years. I really, really do. Thank you. So I think we have some time for some questions. Um, we'll do you want to go at the end or? I thought I was going to say something. Oh, you can go. Yeah. Do you want to do it at the end or now? Sorry? Do you want to do it at the end or now? Or would you prefer? I think I'd rather do it at the end. Well, go now. Sure. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Do you mind? Okay, perfect. Do you mind? Like? Uh, I mean, because it responds. Okay, okay perfect. Do you mind if I just have a glass of water? Uh, but I appreciate that. Uh, I'll, I'll be short because uh, uh, I want to have time for questions and discussions. Not the man himself. Uh, <laughs> I remember being surprised uh, being a delegate uh, in the Clinton White House and uh, a man introduced himself who said he was the full-time historical advisor uh, to the president. Now, I'm sure most PMs and presidential offices have one or more people um, who are um, uh, uh, familiar with history. I mean, it's undoubtedly best to avoid howlers. Like I always remember uh, Jack Lynch in 1978 uh, claiming that um, a leading activist in the 3rd Tipperary Brigade, old, uh, well, IRA, um, Sean Tracy, shot dead and there, was an apostle of peace and reconciliation. Um, and similarly, though I entirely exonerate uh, Patrick from this, uh, uh, there was that wonderful Ender Kenny claim um, that Lenin had called in to Michael Collins to seek a spot of advice. <laughs> um, I, I do um, remember uh, in, in uh, being taken aback in the mid 1970s when Marshal Tito, he was still alive, um, uh, his interpreter claimed that Tito had studied De Valera carefully um, in his youth as he was the first leader of a modern terrorist movement. Uh, when I was first employed by Charles Hohe, I bought second hand from Westport House an original edition of the autobiography of Wolf Tone, United Irish leader, um, and drew from it um, uh, every October for many Bodenstown uh, speeches. Bit of a lad, wasn't he? How he remarked early on. Um, I'm somewhat abashed at. Uh, today's lecture and indeed um, a response, um, um, uh, uh, not, not sure I, I, I deserve the degree of attention, but anyway, thank you very, very much. Um, I'd like to pay tribute um, to both speakers for their contribution to Irish history. Um, Patrick Gagan, his two-volume life of Daniel O'Connell, and to my mind, he's still the most important figure in Irish history, um, uh, Catholic emancipation unlocked the rest, though I do take note what are the, the picture you have uh, downstairs, um, the Duke of Wellington does also um, involve some, um, uh, some credit for 
uh, persuading stroke forcing George IV, and of course he was a founder of this college, co-founder of the college with George IV in, 18, in 1829. Um, but O'Connell mainstreamed the constitutional tradition. And I actually think the constitutional tradition um, in uh, the Republic is more robust than people give it credit for. And I think if necessary, we will see that, uh, we will see that uh, in, 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 in the future. And, and it was something to which Ireland reverted very quickly uh, past the Irish uh, Revolution, 1916 to 23. Uh, Paul Bew has made a terrific contribution uh, to Irish history. Um, the book, funnily enough, was one of his other ones had most influence on me was, I don't know whether I have the title exactly right, but La Mass and the Making of Modern Ireland uh, with Henry, Henry Patterson, um, and in which he drew distinctions between a politician like La Mass um, and our most famous civil servant, um, uh, Ken Whitaker. There is also actually a Patrick Mayhew dimension to this in that he debated with La Mass at the Oxford Union. And in this is 1959, and in a way, May, Mayhew's arguments had some force. So he criticized um, uh, the Republic uh, for being uh, politically, diplomatically isolated and for being economically backward. And I'm, I remember reading this in the Charwell, the student newspaper of the time. Um, and I did actually um, send a copy of my remarks much later on to Patrick Mayhew, who was a colleague in the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, and he was quite, 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 quite interested. But anyway, Lamas um, um, took steps to um, um, uh, uh, to correct both those uh, both those uh, deficiencies. Um, Paul has also been um, at, I don't know how many uh, conferences, association meetings, uh, leading interpreter of what's happening in, in, in Northern Ireland. As we know, he was a uh, friend of David Trimble, who I must say is, while even his friends admit was often a difficult person, um, uh, you know, had made a historic achievement and he exemplified uh, the dictum, if you want things to stay the same, then things have to change. Um, now, unfortunately, I think you're not able to be with us uh, tonight, um, um, Paul's son, John Bew. I remember reading uh, with great um, uh, interest uh, his book on Castlereagh, which um, went well beyond previous biographies and did proper justice, unlike them, uh, to Castlereagh's period as Chief Secretary um, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, it might surprise him, and Paul can pass this on, to know that um, Charles Hohey once read the Wendy Hine biography of Castlereagh. Um, uh, though, and indeed, in, over his summer holidays, and though indeed a staunch Republican, he once said to me, obviously privately, the British would be mad to get rid of the monarchy. Um, history has been a great help uh, to me. Historians have been a great help to me, and I've tried to be of assistance to them. Uh, it was served on the 1798 Commemoration Committee and for the last 10 years on the dec decade of centenaries, you know, taking us from the third Home Rule Bill to, in fact, we're finishing off with Ireland getting admission to the League of Nations in September 1923. And as perhaps two of the things, uh, collaborations I'm proudest of was one with um, uh, helping um, uh, with some co-financing Edith Johnson Lick to uh, complete and publish her six-volume history of the Irish Parliament. This is the old Irish Parliament from 1692 um, uh, to 1800, and also helping um, Angus Mitchell publish a volume of casements um, 
voluminous um, Amazon diaries. Um, pa Patrick um, raised um, uh, the question of identity, and that's always a, a difficulty for second generation um, um, a, a choice. But um, as uh, the Taoiseach pointed out in a recent speech, uh, many Celtic artists that made um, um, replicas of the Tara brooch for daughters of Queen Victoria um, in the late 19th century um, uh, did not conform to notions of a narrow Irish identity. Um, and Daniel Corkery agonised in 1945 um, over the centenary, celebrating the centenary of the death of Thomas Davis um, because he was the son of a British soldier and a Protestant. Um, but I'm certainly glad to, uh, to consider myself as having a broad Irish identity. Um, and I, I think uh, the Anglo-Irish tradition, um, uh, which is certainly what I come from, but I would like to think that I have never been a prisoner of it. Um, and... Uh, being brought up uh, mainly in England uh, may have helped in that regard. Um, children usually react against parents. I have a huge regard for my father's um, uh, input uh, uh, that uh, straddled the Irish Sea uh, and indeed the old and uh, new Commonwealth. Uh, one of his favourite sayings was from Talleyrand, Padazel not too much zeal, which I think is always, um, you know, good advice for those involved in politics. Um, I was keen, as a young person, to, to play a part in the events of my own time. I did PPE at Christchurch. Um, <laughs> I think there may be a few question marks for various reasons over PPE these days, but never mind. Uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> Um, but I find economics is, is, is essential for bread, the bread and butter of modern politics. Um, but philosophy is an excellent training for drafting texts and dealing with ideological arguments. Um, Uh, I did historical research that had nothing to do with either Britain or Ireland, pre-revolutionary French history. And it, 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 um, I, I can remember reading um, a six-volume diary of over a month in a charming French chateau of uh, what's belonging to a president of the Parliament of Paris, um, uh, in a chateau about uh, 30 miles outside. But someone I did identify with, uh, French, was Charles-Francois Lebrun, and uh, 1739 to 1824. He was a um, speechwriter of a powerful but not very popular last chancellor of Louis XV, um, who... Um, um, destroyed and reformed um, the Parlements, but um, uh, and it's primarily that I identified with rather than his later role when he took the tennis court oath, became um, a finance expert, uh, Napoleon's third consul, um, and eventually uh, the real governor of uh, the Netherlands for. Uh, Louis Napoleon, who was the father of Napoleon III. Um, certainly in the peace process, very conscious of history, I won't go over again, um, you know, the importance for me of the Parnell's new departure, which I really studied in 1986, the first centenary of, um, um, uh, of, of the uh, th first Home Rule Bill. And funnily enough, um, I remember Peter Brook telling me in 1989, after he'd been elected Secretary of State, that uh, uh, he had reread the debate on the first Home Rule Bill as one of the ways of um, of, uh, of getting into um, getting into the into the subject. Um, 
Our family lived just two miles away from uh, Solahead Beg, where the first shots um, of the War of Independence took place. Um, two RAC men, uh, both Catholic, one an Irish speaker, had a profound influence um, uh, on my father. Probably my grandfather's house wasn't burnt because of the Belfast CO of the 3rd Tipperary IRA Brigade and one Seamus Robinson, who took the view um, about six sort of poor people's houses, if you like to put it like that, uh, had been burnt in the neighbourhood by the Black and Tans, is we shouldn't stoop to their level. Um, Twelve years later, in 1931, Garda Superintendent uh, John Curtin renting um, my, 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 what became my father's house, um, but he was young and lived up the road, was shot dead at the gates. Um, and uh, uh, it was part of the commemoration, to my surprise, uh, it came out of the blue of Angarda Shikona, their centenary celebrations. Um, uh, this, uh, this, this, this year, and interestingly enough, um, Angarda Shikona, our national police force, um, is headed by uh, uh, the commissioner, Drew Harris, who began his career in the RUC. I see, to conclude, two challenges. Um, however, Ireland constitution, I'm talking about the island of Ireland constitutionally evolves, we have an absolute duty to make sure that it is peaceful and there should be no gratuitous ratcheting up of tensions. Um, I, I th 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 yeah. Um, I, I, the other important thing is to maintain Ireland um, border free, at least in the physical sense. And, you know, the All Ireland economic dimension was behind the idea of a Council of Ireland, which originated with Carson to appease Southern Unionists uh, for the convention in 1917. And it should be, um, you know, perfectly um, uh, feasible. Uh, uh, to have, um, uh, you know, uh, for, for this to be compatible with Northern Ireland, uh, having it, its closest economic links um, with, with GB. And I hope now uh, that the protocol will be largely uh, depoliticized and appropriate technical solutions found. Predictions are a mugs game. I once played a part in, minor part in, Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part Two, in the Archdeacon's Garden in Canterbury, where John of Lancaster, son of Henry IV, uh, turns to um, the rebel uh, Hastings and tells him, you are shallow, much too shallow, to sound the bottom of the after times. And I think it's very, very difficult for any of us because there will be things, um, as uh, Donald Rumpfswell said, unknown unknowns happen that, that can have a big influence uh, of, of, of events. All we can do is, you know, say, say, say where, where, where we are now. But anyway, I would like to thank, finally, um, uh, you know, both speakers for uh, their tributes. Um, I, <laughs> I think if I were asked to do it myself, I might, <laughs> I might be more critical, but anyway. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>three excellent presentations, so rich and um, full of reflections obviously on some really consequential periods uh, in the past but also some provocative uh, ideas to, to chew over in terms of uh, where we go next and, and some of the um, ongoing challenges um, and perhaps even building challenges um, that, that face us now. Um, we have time for some questions um, before we retire to the other room for our reception, so any 
Uh, any questions, please? Please raise your hand. Yes. I think a lot of people were surprised uh, that uh, something could happen in the Republic that could drive together Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, which was the strengthening of Sinn Féin. Uh, do any of you, um, do, do you see anything that could be such a trigger for driving together the Unionists and the Nationalists in Northern Ireland? Let's, let's take um, okay. two more questions and then we'll, we'll go for um, a bundle together. Yes. Uh, just curious to know if we have a historical reference point that we can draw upon as we kind of move into the future around, you know, the rhetoric around border poll, reunification. Because yeah, that's, that's a lot to knit together to countries that have really formed over a hundred years. It might not be a long time in Irish history, but it is a long time. And I think bringing two people together <coughs> has its own challenges, of course, but we always, being Irish, like to look to our past to see what has happened before that we can use as an example of how to get it right or pitfall, pitfalls to avoid in getting it wrong. So I'm curious. I can't think of one in the last thousand years, by the way, but I'd be curious if the panel can. Okay. Well, thank you. That's a gauntlet thrown down to our historians who have to think of something. Great. Thank you. And one more question before we... Let's take a... Oh, no, okay. No, no one's got a burning question. Let's take those two. Oh, sorry, yes, okay. Well, yes. yes. I'd, uh, Paul, um, I'd like to ask you to, um, and I'd also like uh, Patrick to comment on this, to um, elaborate on your point about Southern Irish and the Columbia, because I must say I don't recognise that. And if you read the Southern Irish press, and compare it to the French press and the German press, um, I think you would find that the Southern Irish commentary is anything but... Um, anglophobic. I mean, that's a sort of rift um, running through Irish historical commentary for the last 40 years, inaugurated by Roy Foster, that Southern Irish policy is somehow driven by anglophobia. Actually, there are differences in policy, and um, I think it's understandable, therefore, that you're going to get some kind of standard. But <coughs> anglophobia seems to be too strong. Um, am I missing something? And Patrick, do, do, you, do, you, do you also say that I'm missing something with Paul also? Great, great. Three excellent questions. Patrick, would you like to go first? Yeah, no, some ex excellent uh, questions there. Like, I think, in a way, the first two are almost uh, answered uh, by, by Lord Bew in his, in his, you know, that very profound thing he said at the very beginning about it all being about numbers and about counting and politics ultimately comes down to that. And, of course, the, the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael coalition is, is precisely because they both suffered in that election and, uh, and the numbers, they still needed the Green Party to come in and then there was COVID and all of that. And uh, uh, three parties, Sinn Féin, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, all getting roughly the same amount. And it ties into the border poll question as well, because there you see the more almost you talk about it, the less likely you make it uh, about to happen, because that just increases tensions and inflames. But of course, it suits some people to talk about it because it benefits them to look like they're developing. So I think sometimes if you were interested in it, I think on the anglophobia one, I think I think I'll take maybe a, a middle position, because I do think uh, you see British-Irish relations at their worst, you know, since Brexit than they've been for, um, you know, quite a while. And I do think uh, Brexit created all kinds of, of problems. And, and tied into that, I think, when you look at the rise of Sinn Féin, I think it's maybe a reassurance as someone who, uh, my time as an advisor, was involved in, you know, trying to, you know, well, I suppose fight both Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin. And if I go back in six weeks' time, the big challenge would be trying to stop Sinn Féin. Uh, leading that government, like, is to recognise, and this might reassure Paul, is that the rise for Sinn Féin really has very little to do with Northern Ireland and very little to do with a legitimisation of violence. It, it is all to do with what are seen as the failures of Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil over so many years, especially when it comes to housing, uh, but also when it comes to health, but also a range of other things. So in a recent Sunday Independent poll, um, aged those aged 25 to 36, which is that crucial constituency, and they're all going to Sinn Féin. Now, some in 36, you know, they were nine when the ceasefire, the final ceasefire came. So they've got no experience, really, or memory of, of violence on the island. But 51% uh, of, well, actually, these are figures for the whole population, but 51% of those polled who didn't own property 
or go to vote for Sinn Féin. And of that number, only 9% were going to vote for Fine Gael and 6% for Fianna Fáil. And it's seen as, especially with the young, it is seen as just a massive failure. Now, Fianna Fáil would say, you know, it was terrible because of Fianna Fáil and they've been doing great work the last two years. Uh, Fianna Fine Gael would say they've been doing great work, but of course uh, there was Brexit and a crash caused by Fianna Fáil. And like, there's all the, the apportioning of blame. But uh, like uh, Paul mentioned derision, I think there was a certain amount of wry humour at, at observing the events of the last uh, a few months in Britain. But I, I think, and this is where I'd maybe disagree with Rich, there, there has been a certain amount of anger with what was perceived as maybe bad faith in terms of some of the things that happened. That a deal, like the only thing that really annoys me about my children is if you agree something and you have a deal and then that deal is not followed. Uh, but you have examples where... Uh, uh, an agreement was reached that allowed a Prime Minister to have his election that was Brexit ready and oven ready. But then afterwards, the very people uh, like Lord Frost saying, oh no, we didn't realise it was this and we didn't think it was this. And you had the very people who had agreed to a deal now reneging on it, claiming that they didn't understand it. And I certainly felt a certain amount of uh, uh, anger at that and, uh, and certain times when a certain ignorance when it came to Ireland and a certain devil may care attitude when it came to Ireland we have uh, the current Home Secretary glad to see back after a short absence but, uh, previous, but previously the Attorney General but talking about you know uh, 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 the UK uh, withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights that convention is mentioned four times in the Good Friday Agreement and, you know, there are elements that underpin the Good Friday Agreement that people don't seem to have any uh, concern about or care about. And these, now, these are things that I, areas that I decided I wouldn't get into. But, it, but in any case, there's a certain amount of, I think, um, I, I think a certain amount of anger that I think a certain amount is justified because of the way. And I think uh, it is about reconciling and resolving these and about moving beyond these and about uh, restoring some of these things but uh, I, I certainly don't think it was all on one side. And I certainly think a, a rock was thrown through this, but that rock was not thrown from Ireland. Um, on the anglophobia question, uh, I, unlike Richard, you're lucky enough in this case not to live on the island. And I do. And it's very, there are no, it, at the time, for example, when Martin and I were really at this, uh, and you could hear it, by the way, in Patrick's paper. There were important organs in the uh, uh, Dublin media uh, in ways which I'm certain that rightly annoyed Martin uh, uh, because I absolutely respect his good faith in what he was doing in the 1990s but saying this is making love to terrorists, it's ridiculous and so on. That's now entirely disappeared from the culture. Now, there is no terrorism, and that's part of the reason. There is a dominant attitude an explanation of Brexit, which I happen to be against, was against, largely because I could see it would make trouble in Ireland. Frankly, it's made a lot more trouble than was necessary or I expected, but I could, there was no way it wasn't going to make trouble. Uh, um, but the, 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 that having been said, the dominant Irish analysis is, this is Colonel Blimp, in Kemp, who is old-fashioned imperialist nostalgia, etc. Fintan O'Toole is the most brilliant Irish journalist. He wrote them a totally redemptive piece in the last two weeks uh, on, on, on this business of IRA songs. A brilliant, brilliant piece, corresponding to how unacceptable this was to him. But Fintan endlessly writes books, and they're all to the eye. The basic dominant, dominant concept is Colonel Blink, Blimp emerged from somewhere in Kent, uh, um, waving his Union Jack and, and imperialist nostalgia, not to British people, but Brexit. It is, in fact, an anti elite, anti old ruling class revolt for all its words. It's so obvious that anybody lives here that it represents a, 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 an anti elitist revolt. I used to, uh, uh, when I, in a previous life, as chairman of the Committee on Standards and Public Life, we look at, used to look at the polling. And in the months after Brexit, we look at satisfactory political institutions. Social classes A and B quite happy with the political institutions of Britain before Brexit. C and D, most not. It's all a fraud, it's all a cheat. 
in the months after Brexit, it reversed completely. Social class is envy. It is outrageous. It's dreadful. Who are these morons who are inter interfering with our, 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 our latte culture? And on the other hand, see, see indeed something. At last, there's some justice in this referendum. Our irritations, our exasperations are respected. Ireland completely chooses to believe. Well, I, I agree with all that. But, 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 uh, but, but it's the dominant Irish meme. Yes, on, on, I'm saying reductivism on the other side, describing bigotry to your opponents, is not a solution either. No, I, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's just I'm different. It sounds like bigotry. And, and that is the context. In part. I absolutely accept everything that, 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 that Patrick has said about uh, you know, the polling shows, the housing, and these other questions being the key issues. And Owen O'Brien, who is my student, is the most brilliant of the of, 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 of the Sinn, Sinn Féin TDs in this respect. But the truth is, modern Ireland is materially a success. This is so obvious by any standards in Irish history. It is materially a success. Uh, 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 and it was not, through much of my adult life and Martin's, a material success. Now it is. And there's a paradox here. It may be that it's a less serious place, actually, than it once was. And the decline of the Catholic Church, which was one area, which I never thought I'd find myself saying, is one area of a decline in a capacity to actually think seriously and morally about, about political issues. I, I'm partly influenced by the fact that during COVID, as we all did, we played with computers and family history. And I discovered that my great uncle, whom I knew to be a Catholic priest, was actually the longest serving Catholic chaplain in the First World War in the British Army from beginning to end. And think how many de men, men died in his arms, if you think of that. Uh, um, so I, I've now started to think perhaps slightly more sympathetically, as you can find in my books, including the Sean Lebas book that Martin mentioned, more sympathetically. About, and I realize all the dreadful things about old school, poor Catholic Ireland, and so on. But there, there's a part of me, to be paradoxical, which I have to say, I don't recognise how deeply unserious the place now is. More prosperous, more modern, and all that. And uh, absolutely, I quite understand there's lots of things that British government, I think this phase is over. To be absolutely honest, it was over under Liz Truss. And can you imagine how unbearable it was for Liz Truss, Mrs O'Leary? to be lectured by Irish-American politicians who, if you're learning about, have distinctly low real Irish inheritance in most cases. Distinctly low. And she is Mrs O'Leary, but nonetheless, they assume a moral uh, superiority on this issue. The games that we play are so absurd. And Mrs O'Leary began the process. Uh, 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 historians will be kind to her in that respect. Uh, uh, and the new... Uh, uh, Tonight, I think there's a first conversation between the, 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 the Prime Minister and the Taoiseach, the new Prime Minister, and this will be continued. And certain aspects of this recent problem will, will disappear. And I absolutely accept stupid things said on the British. Mrs May's case, she started off by saying, Ireland's not a very important place, why am I being bothered about it? And then she collapsed completely. And if you know and you're an Irish negotiator, when she's lost the election, they had her on the floor. And that's why she took it. And frankly, I know perfectly well that Lee in Dublin, because I'm part of the Irish official classes at one level, part of me is part of that world, The Lee at the, at the 2017 negotiation, the joint agreement, and the collapse of the British negotiating team, which then led, which is basically sets the terms. I mean, how delighted must you be when you get the British government to sign up an agreement which says it's going to respect the island economy? At that point, all island trade was 2%. How delighted you must be to kind of get these formula in, which are very Irish nationalist formula, the island economy and so on. We all, and there is an economy on the island of Ireland. It's just that more than that, there are two economies. Uh, uh, how you, and you get the British government to sign At that point, all island trade was 2%. Uh, uh, you know, th this is a squeezing down of a weak prime minister by a temporarily stronger Ireland. Now, at this moment, the conjuncture is different. The UK is stronger. The Ukraine war has made it more a, a more wider. Uh, um, I've got quite the word is you of course talk about the French and German. I'm sure they're full of things. Fact of the matter is, UK has been central to Europe's stand and has led it. And that has consequences in, 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 in terms of where the UK now is. And it is stronger than it was then. 
and we are going to see a recalibration of the deal. I hope exactly along the lines, I thought Martin phrased, what did you say, Martin, the deep in size uh, settlement, the compromise, uh, you, I thought your wording was absolutely superb in that respect. So that's what I would say about this, this is more complicated. And Anglophobia is there in Dublin, which is never, and I do go back to what I originally said. In Martin Sam in my time, Dublin people, Dublin four, the great thing was, do the, I remember James Diney, Parish Independent Martin, was saying, do the English know the intelligent conversations we have in Dublin four? That's what he wanted as a top Dublin journalist. The English knew that we too are civilized and read books. That's what he wanted. And I remember saying, and his irritation was he suspected there were some lots of English people who didn't know that. That question would never be asked by any Dublin political writer today. They don't care what the English think about the conversations in Dublin 4. They know the conversations in Dublin 4 are brilliant, scintillating, and can't be beaten anywhere else in the world. It's a different, entirely different mindset. Thank you. I, um, we are um, I, I, slightly over time. Would yeah. you like to offer a final yeah. few words? Yeah. Well, when it comes to the relationship, there's also a certain sense of shame that people in Ireland feel uh, when uh, they see certain things that are said uh, by the nearest neighbour. Like when uh, you, you hear a Home Secretary say in all seriousness that her dream is to see the front page of a Daily Telegraph uh, saying that the first flight has taken uh, the refugees off to Rwanda. Uh, there is a sense of, of deep shame at that, that a civilised country could have a, a Home Secretary say that that is her proudest moment. We had her predecessor as Home Secretary say before she became Home Secretary that a way of preventing Ireland, stopping Ireland uh, from going, uh, pursuing the backstop was food shortages, bringing up echoes of the Great Irish Famine. And when you hear things like that, then there is a certain amount of feeling on the subject, I have to say. And it is not anger at England, but it is a sense of disappointment that history has been forgotten. It is a sense of deep and profound sadness. It is a real sense of upset that we on the islands of Ireland, North and South, are being caught in the crossfire of conservative politics over here. And the reason why unification is on the agenda in Ireland is because what has become absolutely clear to people in Northern Ireland, nationalists, unionists, and people who describe themselves as neither, is that Britain, the British government, does not care about them, does not understand their position, and does not have any interest in their future. And that is why they are forced to reluctantly think that perhaps their future lies elsewhere. And I have to say, as someone who is a huge admirer of Britain and its history, and its traditions and its people, I feel a huge sense of sadness at the things that have happened since 2016. Thank you. On that note, I think we will draw things to a close. Um, thank you so much to our speakers for giving us a huge amount to think about and to reflect upon. Um, thank you all for your uh, attention and your excellent questions. And please do stay and join us for uh, the reception afterwards. So thank you.